This is new to me. I've worked a lot of rooms, but I've never worked from a pulpit. So <laughs> watch out. All right, so deception detection. That's what we're here for, right? So we can walk through this together. The technical name is forensic statement analysis. That's what we call it in the biz, the law enforcement biz. And that's from during an investigation, we have somebody write a statement, and then there's several techniques that we can layer over that statement to tell whether they're being deceptive or not, and if they're being deceptive, exactly where. And then when we have the interview, it makes the interview a lot more impactful. It's kind of like this. When I learned how to do this back in 99, about halfway through the class, I was like, wow, this is magic, because it starts jumping out at you. And as we work through this tonight, you'll probably experience that at some level, too. Has anybody been, in here been lied to? I'm not the only one? OK, good. What this is about is finding the lies. Now, I've talked to some moms tonight as they were coming in. And moms, you have some of this in your DNA. Us guys, it's a little tougher for. But we're going to have some fun tonight. So a little bit about who I am. I started my public safety, public service career in 1977, before many of you were born, as a military policeman. And then from there, I went to, after I got out of the Army, I went to Baytown, which is a suburb of Houston, Texas, where I spent five and a half years there. And then I went from there to the Travis County Sheriff's Office, where I spent the next 25 years promoted up through the rank of captain, have led every aspect of a sheriff's office, managed $80 million budgets, hundreds of people. And that's where I was working when I learned this. And I think I went by one picture a little quick, but that's okay. So while I was at the sheriff's office, I did several different things from being on horses, being a detective, riding motorcycles. That particular part there is in the mid-90s, being involved with our association at the Sheriff's Office. We had a problem there, much like Kootenai County faces now with attrition, and I got heavily involved in that and ended up winning a statewide award for solving that problem. As a commander in a law enforcement agency, there is an avenue open to the FBI Academy that they call the FBI National Academy. In 1999, I attended that, which is a three-month in-house. You live at Quantico for three months and go through like a 21-hour college semester. And that's where I learned the stuff we're going to talk about tonight. And from there, when I retired from Travis County, I went to Columbia 911, where I ran a 911 organization for a little while. They made that sound a lot funner than it was when I got there, so I didn't stay there long. And in 2011, I retired to, or came to here, I'm not really retired, but moved to Kootenai County, where I now run a training and consulting business and do that internationally. All the credentials there on the bottom were about bachelor's degree, all the stuff you got to do to climb the corporate ladder, which has nothing to do with tonight. For tonight, we're going to, hopefully you'll find this interesting. I, like I said, that's like magic when I learned how to do it. It's going to be interactive. You all get to play along. We're going to, we're, we're going to walk through several statements, and some of these statements are from real cases, whether they're uh, robberies or homicides, or we're going to walk through a few of those real life so you can interact in those. And then once we get done doing the case stuff, we're going to move into in the news and politics, which is where this you'll find really handy. So we're going to have some fun. So what is statement analysis? Typically, it's the analysis of a statement. Normally, it's handwritten that we get from our witness or suspect or whoever we want to talk to. And then we analyze that statement and determine whether there's deception in it or not. And that makes our interview, when we have it, a lot more impactful. The way the Lord created us, our bodies are in conflict with itself when we lie. 
That's how a polygraph works. When we're deceptive and you're on a polygraph, your blood pressure changes, your heart rate changes, your perspire, the body's in conflict with itself. The Lord made us not to lie. So when we do, that's what happens. Statement analysis works much the same way. Your body will give you away on a polygraph when you're deceptive. If you know what to listen for and look for, your words will give you away. The same way your body reacts, the words we use when we're deceptive will change. And that's what we're going to walk through tonight is how those words change when we're deceptive. Because your mind, your psyche, whatever you want to call it, when you're deceptive, won't let you use the words you're used to using. It'll change them, but you don't know they're changing. But that's what we're looking for when we do the analysis. Oops, looking at the wrong screen, sorry. So it's an examination of words independent of case facts. One of the things I do now is I consult for agencies across the country and actually internationally on cases and do statement analysis. Are any of you, have any of you paid attention to the South Idaho News or East Idaho, whatever they call it? The, I'm just drew a blank on his last name. A little baby in 2015 went camping with mom and dad and grandpa and disappeared. Dior, baby Dior case. Anybody familiar with that? I'm consulting on that case. And poor baby Dior has not been found, but mama and grandpa know where he is. They just haven't told us yet. So you don't have to know anything about the case to do the analysis. It works independent just on the words. I get the statement, I work the statement, and then I produce the questions and stuff for the agencies to ask and why they need to ask and where. So I'll give you a little sample of how it works. I need a victim. I mean a, a helper. <laughs> Tell me what you did from the time, from noon till you got here. I got a ride, I walked home to my parents' house, and I worked on my door. Okay, and then you came here. Okay, let's do a little lie detection. Did you tell me everything you did this afternoon or just what you wanted me to know? Uh, just the hot spots. Right. <laughs> Everybody edits. What we're looking for is whether they're editing for deception or whether they're editing for courtesy. My wonderful helper edited for courtesy because telling me everything would have been too much information and some private information and things I didn't need to know. So. She edited it out of courtesy versus deception. But one of the things we look for is, in that editing, which one is it? But when you do it for deception, how many football fans do I got? All right, as I go through this presentation tonight, think about it, a referee throwing a flag. Whenever you see color on the screen, because we use highlighters and different markers, when you see color on the screen, that's equivalent to a referee throwing a flag. If I'm working a statement and I just got a couple of flags on the ground, it's not a big deal. But if they're getting knee and waist deep, then we got a problem. So it's all about the words. When we're being honest, we're telling a story. We're conveying what happened from memory. It doesn't take a lot of energy to do that because it's in our memory. And the more traumatic it is, the more it is seared into our memory. The details are consistent. You can tell it frontwards, backwards, and sideways, and it's in past tense, because it's already happened. How many of you watched or listened to the Ford Kavanaugh hearings? It's been a what, about a year ago now, however long ago? Mrs. Ford said it was so traumatic it was seared in her memory. I did a statement analysis on both of their opening statements. She said it was so traumatic it was seared in her memory. But then when she answered most of the questions, they were, I don't remember. But that doesn't work. Where Judge Kavanaugh was very upset. You remember him being upset? 
That is what we call requisite emotion. When you're, when something is, you, we have an attachment to things we care about, whether it's people or things, we have an attachment to those. When those are harmed, they cause an emotional response. His career and livelihood, and even being able to coach his daughter's team was in jeopardy. He displayed the requisite emotion for what he was being accused of. So that's how it works when we're honest. It's past tense, lots of details, frontwards, backwards, sideways, and it doesn't take a lot of mental energy to do that. When we're being deceptive, we're trying to convince. We're creating the events. Oftentimes they will slip into present tense terms. So if I'm interviewing somebody or they're writing a statement and it's past tense, past tense, past tense, past tense, current, 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 past, 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 all that current tense was a lie. Because as they were making it up, their brain goes into current tense. They can't keep it up. It takes a lot of mental energy to try to keep up the lie. So if you get them writing enough or talking enough, they're gonna blow it. The details are inconsistent and there's not a lot of them. And they can't tell their story frontwards, backwards, and sideways. The Bible even says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. As human beings, we are inherently lazy. We want to do things as simplistic as possible. Me especially. I'm a KISS principle guy. So when we're telling a story, we tell it chronologically, succinctly, with as much detail as we think is necessary. Yes be yes, no be no. If there's any more than that, then that makes you gotta start wondering. Now there are some people that are just real flowery with words and they can, you know, just do it all day. Well, that's their norm. But most people, chronologically, succinctly, with as much detail as possible, and you're done. And in past tense. If there's any more than that, then it makes us wonder. It's all about the words. Our psyche will make us change the words if we're deceptive. So when we're analyzing those statements, we're always asking ourselves, does it read right? If I was telling a story, is this the way I would tell it? Does it sound right? Always putting yourself in the place of the writer and is this the way I would tell this story if I was telling it? Is it the shortest, most succinct way to say it? Does it make sense? And if the answer to any of those is no, then you gotta start asking yourself why. And then you end up asking them why. When we use it, at the beginning of an investigation or any time that we think our writer is being deceptive. It takes a lot of time to do, so most investigators that I know have a caseload to such an extent that they cannot use this on every case. They have to cherry pick the cases they wanna apply this to. I have found it most effective in person's crime cases, whether it's an assaultive case, sexual assault case, there's the way we use our pronouns is very indicative and easy to, to pick out the lies in those instances. How we do it? Old fashioned, legal pad and ink pen. Make them write it down or put a record in front of them and get them to talk and then have that transcribed. No emails, no Word documents because if they're typing and they give me a paragraph of information and then they're, you know, maybe I don't want to say that after all, they back that out, I don't know if it happened or not. They erased it. If they're handwriting it and they change their mind, they got to mark it out. And then when they mark it out, then I can try to figure out why they marked it out. And the instructions are much like I asked my assistant, tell me what happened from the time he got up until the police came. Tell me what happened from the time he got up until the fire truck came, whatever it is, Tell me about some time before the event, and then the event, and then I apply the techniques. Our tools, how it works. Pronouns, nouns, verbs. Now, how many of you did that, those words, three words, send a shiver up your spine? When I was in school, I got what my wife calls three-legged A's in English grammar or one-legged A in English grammar. In other words, I ain't very good at it. But we use cheat sheets and I give, when I do my classes, I give them cheat sheets to use. 
the segment you're getting tonight is a little bit out of a 24-hour class. The class I do is normally 24 hours. So nouns, pronouns, verbs, time, if our writer writes down time, and then balance, kind of like a book, opening, body, close. The process is, what is their norm and how they're going to communicate with us? Figure out the norm, and then look for a deviation. Anytime there's a deviation, that's a flag. Everybody has a norm. So it does not make any difference what educational level the person is, what ethnicity. None of those things matter. Everybody has a norm on how they communicate. Our job is to figure out what is their norm, and then watch for the deviations. And whenever they, de whenever they deviate, that's a flag. If there's a bunch of flags, then we got a problem. If there's not a bunch of flags, then maybe not. Our tools, highlighters and an ink pen. Four color highlighters and an ink pen. And that's what they mean. Lack of conviction is green, extraneous information is yellow. If you're using editing words or phrases, that's pink. If your verb tense changes, that's blue. Or anytime there's a statement made in that statement that I wanna ask why or explore more, I just put a blue box around it. So when you're when you see one of the statements we've worked, you'll see a whole bunch of different colors, ink pen lines, write, writing, notes, and boxes on it. Is how they look when we're done. So the first technique we're gonna do tonight is lack of conviction. I don't know, I don't recall, I think, maybe. If somebody's alleging a crime or something's been of theirs has been harmed, whether somebody slashed their tires, broke a window, whatever it is, they should be able to tell me succinctly and chronologically about the event. If I get, I don't know, I think, maybe, then it makes me start wondering how true to the event they are. Or if they oversell the event, I mean, I really, really, really was mad. Yes be yes, no be no. I don't need a whole bunch of oversell. Oversell is another indicator of deception. The next technique we look for is extraneous information. And I got a cartoon for extraneous, so I'll let you do this one for yourself. A lot of extraneous, non-useful information. Extraneous information is any information that does not answer the question. It does not mean it's not valid information in the context of the statement, but it did not answer the question that was asked. And you'll see some examples as we work through some of these statements. The next technique is editing. After, later, began, before, started. Any words like that or combination of words like that in a sentence, especially at the beginning of a sentence, is being used to replace a body of information. The one I see most of the time is later. A sentence will stop, they'll start the next sentence with later, and then explain something. Well, what happened between that period and the later that they just skipped into the next sentence with? They're leaving out whether it's a sentence, a paragraph, a page, there's information missing. So let's work through our first one together. Are you ready? We're going to do a house fire. So when we get done, you tell me whether this is a house fire or an arson. It's a mayor of a small town. His house burnt down. And this is his statement that he gave to the investigators. I worked at my office, city hall, on and off, all day. I went to Duras's to eat supper at the Catfish Kitchen at around 6 or 7. So on and off and around 6 or 7. Do we talk like that? Sure we do. I've been here since about 5 o'clock, 5.30. I wish I would have ate dinner at around 4.30. <laughs> so 
So just because it meets the definition and why I highlight it does not necessarily mean it's deception. It just meets the definition. So if I analyze this statement, is this the only green spots I see or the only discoloration in the paper I see, then we don't have a problem. But if, as we move on, if there's more color to be added, then we might have a problem. So I think I came home after that. I may have went to City Hall later, I'm not sure. But if I did, it'll be on the police log. Now the way I take that, this is a mayor of a small town, so him saying that he works at City Hall and insinuating that he can get in the building after hours, I take as a subtle attempt of intimidation in a statement to try to, to intimidate whoever's doing the investigation, but you don't know who I am. I remember watching TV, AETN, later than the news, and the last thing I remember was watching the David Letterman show. So the city hall, the police log, that's blocked because, like I said, I think that's a little intimidation that he's putting in there. I just want to <coughs> note of that. After, there's an editing word, but it's in the middle of a sentence. So it's not a big a deal since it's in the middle of a sentence. But now we have a later at the beginning of a sentence. So what happened between AETN and the news? If I've got a TV guide, are we missing 30 minutes? Are we missing an hour, two hours? How much time is missing out of this statement that they substituted with one word later? I watched AETN later than the news. So something happened during that later that they stuck the word in instead of telling me what happened. The last thing I remember was watching David Letterman show. So what happened between the period and the then? We're going to come back to that. I was real tired. I cut the TV off at around 12 or 12.30. I'm not sure. So that's lack of conviction. I cut the lights off, sat in the hallway floor, maybe 15, 20 minutes. All right, show of hands. When you go to bed tonight or any night, how many of you have to sit in the hallway and take a break before you go get in bed? <laughs> so that's why that's blocked out as why do you got to take a break in the hallway? I got up, went to my bed, closed the door, laid down. How many of you close your bedroom door when you go to bed? Okay, how many of you not? I'm asking the question there is because it's, I'm trying to figure out what their standard modus operandi are. What's, do you always close the door or only the night you burn your house down? <laughs> my wife and I, when our kids were little, we closed the door. Now that they're grown, we don't close the door. So it's just a MO question. And then laid down. What's he telling you there? I closed the door, laid down. Or what is he not telling you? What's he insinuating? That he went to bed or went to sleep. We don't use synonyms in statement analysis. He said he laid down. That means he laid down. He didn't go to bed or go to sleep. The next thing I remember, something woke me up. I'm not sure what it was. I think it was the smoke alarm. I remember one of the things we look for is, does that make sense? If the smoke alarm here in this building went off right now, what would happen? Sorry. Your heart would be pounding, right? When I cook at my house, the smoke alarm means dinner's ready. And it still makes me jump. So his, the, I'm not sure what woke me up. I think it was a smoke alarm. In Texas, we say that dog don't hunt. I'm not sure of the rest, but I think I could not see real good, but I could not breathe, get my breath very good. I went to the window and after that, I'm not sure. The next thing I remember for sure was people talking to me. So all that, the ending of his statement is all lack of conviction. With an editing word right in the middle of a sentence. So what do you think? How many think it's an arson? How many think it's just a regular house fire? He came together right here. Between the AETN and the news, what he removed was and replaced with later was setting up all the implements to burn his house down. That's what happened to that block of time. Then, a 
cut the lights off, sat in the hallway floor 15 minutes. He was watching to make sure all the implements that he had set up, lighting the candle, everything was burning down. Things were progressing the way his plan was working. Once he saw that was working, he got up, closed the bedroom door because he knew that would keep the fire out of the bedroom. And he went and laid down, waiting for the smoke alarm to continue his charade. That's why when the smoke alarm went off, he wasn't scared or frightened or startled because he was waiting for it laying down waiting for it, and that's why there's so much lack of conviction about it. I'm not sure what woke me up, maybe the smoke alarm. And then I, went to, I could not breathe real good, could not see real good. He's not complaining about coughing and wheezing and eyes burning. He's just saying what he thinks should happen if legitimately he was in bed when he woke up when his house was on fire. But since that's not how it played out, he can only say what he, how he thought it should play out versus how it actually played out. That makes sense? Everybody with me? Are we having fun yet? What is missing in this statement? I mentioned it a little while ago. What's missing? Besides truth, yeah. (laughs) Whoops. Did I not have it up there? Is he very upset about his house burning down? He does not display the requisite emotion. There's no fright. There's no dismay, there's no upset in his story. If he, his house legitimately burned down while he was sleeping, he would have the requisite fear and upset in his story, which is missing. So now let's talk about verbs. Verbs express action either in the past, present, or future tense. Most of the time in our investigations, we're looking for it to be in the past tense because the events already happened. The exception to that rule is if it's a missing person case. If whoever is complaining or making the complaint or the outcry about the missing person, they're going to talk about that missing person in the current tense. My my baby needs me, she wants me, versus needed me, wanted me. If the complainant makes the mistake of using past tense on a missing person case, that is a 15-yard ejectionable penalty on that they already know they're deceased because they should never refer to them in the past tense. When they do that, that's an automatic, we got them. What we have found sometimes is with mothers, it may be years before they can refer to that child in the past tense. Even when they died, and I hate to use this word legitimately, but whether it's a car wreck or illness or whatever, once their child is deceased, mothers can sometimes, it'll take years before they can address the past tense. So they'll still be talking about them in the current tense. So when we're doing an investigation on a missing person and they automatically go to the past tense, boom, we're done. So now let's do a little short, simple one with verb tense change. It happened Saturday night. I went out on my back deck to water the plants. It was almost dark. A man runs out of the bushes, comes onto the deck, grabs me, knocks me down. So there's all our current tense. So if this was a legitimate statement we were taking, he might have been out on his back deck watering his plants, but the rest of it's baloney because the verb tense changed. So now let's talk about pronouns. Pronouns are the parts of speech that take the place of nouns. I, me, you, he, she, all take the place of nouns. To me, when I get a case to investigate now, I go straight to the pronouns because that's the easiest place to find the deception. When I teach my classes, I make them go through all those other steps we talked about first, but I'll go straight to the pronouns because that's the easiest. And I'll show you. I parked and started getting out of my car when a white male about 200 pounds, six feet tall, approached me and told me to get in the car or he would hurt me. He then got in the back, I got in the front and began to drive. He told me to drive west on the highway. I asked, he asked me if I had any money, I told him no. We drove for about an hour. During that hour, he, t- he hit me repeatedly on the right side of my face. When we got to the exit, I told him I had no gas. So let's work that just for the pronouns. We circle all the pronouns and we look for the deviation as we do the circling.
In line eight, we have a we. We is a relationship term. Our complainant is alleging being carjacked. There is no relationship if she's getting carjacked. The we is another 15 yard penalty. There should not be a relationship. Even if you are in a relationship and you violate that relationship, when your spouse makes the complaint, there will be no relationship. I know I'm in trouble at home when I, my wife uses my first name. <laughs> or the kitchen cabinets are closing a little hard. <laughs> and you guys know what I'm talking about. We as a relationship, there should not be a relationship. So that's a, that's a big penalty. And then it happens again. Should not be a relationship. So well, I, would, I would stop this, I would stop doing the analysis and right here just say, this is a lie. I wouldn't waste my time doing all the other techniques because there's, should not be a relationship and there is. That's one of the things we look for in the analysis is proper relationships. Are they establishing a relationship where there should be one? And is there not a relationship where there should not be one? Here's the other part of the statement. He got mad, told me to get off the exit. We went straight off the exit for about four to five miles. There's another we. He told me to turn down the first street on my left. We went down at about a quarter of a mile. He told me to stop. He opened the door, put his feet out. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We equals a relationship. There should not be a relationship. What else is missing? Say it again. Requisite emotion. Is she very upset about getting carjacked? No. If this was a legitimate carjacking, where is the, what? Well, let me ask one of the ladies over here. If you got carjacked, what would be going through your mind? If, I, if you're doing this here, I'm making you drive wherever, what's going through your mind? Fear, panic about what? Are you gonna live through it? Are you gonna be assaulted through it? Is there any of that emotion in this statement? None. So now let's add another part of pronouns. Pronouns and tension. Remember I said our bodies are in conflict when we lie. God made us that way. I got up at 7 a.m. when my alarm went off. I took a shower, got dressed, I decided to go out for breakfast. I went to McDonald's on the corner, met a man who lives nearby, talked with him a few minutes, I finished breakfast and drove to work. Notice we're missing our pronouns there? He was using pronouns early on, I, 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 when he went to McDonald's and had breakfast, had that conversation at breakfast, the eyes fell out. We call that tension by absence. When the pronoun falls out, that means there is tension in the moment. So if this was a legitimate statement on investigation, I wanna know what about the man at the McDonald's caused stress. He obviously knows who the man is because it caused stress to meet that man and have the conversation. Why was there stress? Is it a neighbor that they got a property line dispute with? Is it his wife's ex-boyfriend? What caused stress meeting that person and having a conversation that the pronouns fell out? But the writer doesn't know the pronouns fell out, so that's how we find it. Now let's talk about time, the use of time. Not all of our writers will use time but if they do, it's an indicator. Just like the words we use, we look for the norm and then look for a deviation of the norm. So let's work through one together. So I've noted the time that they use all down the right margin. So analyze the time and how they're using time and decide whether they're being deceitful or not. And I'll give you the, the cue here in a minute. I got up at 7 a.m., got dressed. I was downstairs by 7.15 and had coffee. I was out the door by 7.30. It took me about 20 minutes to get to work. 
around 8, the boss stopped by and talked for about 10 minutes. I began working on a project until 11.50 when I went to lunch. It took me five minutes to get to the lunchroom. I stayed there until 12.25, and then I came back to the office and went back to work at 12.30. Anybody see any problems with the time? Well, there's a block of time missing over here when they worked on the project, but that's an explainable block of time missing. Because what else would they notate time for when they're working on a project? But how they use time changed when they went to lunch. Before lunch, it was by 7.15, by 7.30, about 20, around 8, about 10. All the times before lunch had a little bit of lack of conviction to them. When this person gets to lunch, it's firm until 11.50, 5 minutes, 12.25, 12.30. They're exact. They changed their norm. If it was going to stay the norm, it would have been around 11.50, about five minutes, until about 12.25. They took out that lack of conviction, which was their norm. This is excellent. I mean, we use it in the police world, but I've also taught uh, HR professionals and other people like that how to use it in their business realm. To give you an idea how this statement could be used here, say during the lunch hour, whoever's watching the front desk, somebody comes in and takes $100 out of their purse. Half a dozen people had access to that. I'd get them all to write the statement, and depending on how they use their words during that time in question in the lunch hour would determine whether they stay on the suspect list or off the suspect list, so it helps us narrow down based on how they write their statement. Let's do one more on time. So I'll let you read this one, and then I'll give you about a minute, and then I'm going to ask you a question. If the event in question happened at the gym, is this person a suspect or no? Who says yes? How many say no? Now, I've been told by people that frequent the gym, and you can tell I ain't one, that they know exactly what they did, you know, for every minute there at the gym. They did this, 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 and this. But that's not the question they were asked. The question was, what happened from the time he got up until the time he went to bed? So the before the gym and the after gym, their times are very vague. They broke their norm when they got to the gym. The event in question happened at the gym. That's where they broke their norm. That's a flag. So now let's work through another one. This is a, a, a missing purse. And this was done by email, which is not the way I like to do it, but the agency that was doing this investigation sent me to, they let the person write their statement by email, and this is the way it came in. Did I push something? Oh, there it is. Hi, Paul, per your request, on Tuesday, October 25th, and let me get all the colors up there. So all the yellow is extraneous information, which means it does not answer the question about what happened with the purse. The hi, Paul. Now, this is an employee of a hospital sending an email about a missing purse to the sergeant that's doing the investigation. Hi, Paul is a little casual. They might be high Paul on the day-to-day -day basis, but during investigation, it would be sergeant. So high Paul, per your request, is a bit casual and strikes me as extraneous. And then talking about the traffic jam and et cetera is extraneous information. So they went to Coles, however, lost a pronoun there. Instead of a I turned around, just turned around in the parking lot, did not go in because of the traffic jam on 270 southbound 
would have taken me additional time that I did not have to get back to Des Purse Park, however you say that. Lost their pronoun on came back. What came, what caused the, why is there stress on returning to the hospital? I parked near the rear loading dock, entered through the hallway, lost a pronoun there, into the restroom just outside the lab. While, that's an editing word, entering the restroom, there was a purse on the floor behind the door. You're walking into a restroom, we push the door open. How do you know there's a purse behind the door? Unless you know beforehand, or there's not really a purse behind the door. The purse was open, the wallet exposed, so I checked the cell phone just in case it was just left open. Just as in only or just that's all that happened. The ID belonged to pharmacy employee Jennifer Stinson, took it to my department, found Jennifer, she was not aware it was missing. Nothing seemed missing per Jennifer. I'm thinking this had to be around 4 p.m.-ish when I left the purse with her and left the building. In hindsight, I wish I would have turned it in, yada, yada. So all that part is extraneous information. It has nothing to do with what happened with the purse. Checking the pronouns. Security at that moment, what moment would that be? Does somebody want to venture a, an opinion? Our writer was mad at a coworker. To get even with a coworker, she was going to take her purse and just throw it in a dumpster. So she took the purse, left work. As she got down toward the mall or wherever it was she was headed, she realized that she had the wrong purse. So now she's got to get the purse back. So she comes back, parks by the loading dock, which is not her usual entrance, goes in to the re women's restroom where she can plant the, the purse behind the door, but her story doesn't make sense. She said she saw the purse behind the door going into the restroom. She wouldn't see the purse coming out of the restroom, not going into the restroom, so that part doesn't make sense. So in questioning her about those details, she admits she was mad at somebody, took their purse, was gonna throw it away, realized she had the wrong purse, and then had to figure out how to get it back to who it belonged to, and this is how she did it. And lost her job. For it. Any other thoughts on questions or where we're at? All right, let's bring all the techniques together on a robbery case. The evening shift started out, the evening started out normally. That's extraneous. What does that mean? It does not answer the question of what happened. It says start out normally. That, that doesn't tell me anything. I closed up after all the customers had left. I worked a late shift last night because I had an appointment during the day. We're still not talking about what happened. Some more extraneous down there. Current tense. So bringing it all together, I worked a late shift last night because I had an appointment during the day. I counted the money, filled out the deposit slip. I was the last one out, so I set the alarm and locked the doors. Drove to First National Bank. Do we have any problems yet? We lost our pronoun when we went to the bank. Why is there stress taking the deposit to the bank? To make my deposit. Is it my deposit because I'm a conscious employee and I'm going to make sure the money gets in the bank? Or is it my deposit because... Is going in my pocket. I usually park right next to the deposit box. Then why didn't you tonight? Got out of my car, headed for the deposit box. So we have stress again once they get to the bank and they're getting out of their car. Why are they having stress? They're just making the deposit. A tall man approaches, current tense, a white guy around 6'2", I think, He comes out of nowhere, tells me to drop the bag. What's the difference between a deposit and a bag? One of them has money in it. 
Nothing like this has ever happened before. I'm very careful about where I park and anyone's around, which begs the question, then why weren't you tonight? I dropped the bag, froze right where it was, the man grabbed the bag and ran off into the shadows. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and that's basically what happened. So I would take the statement, tear it off, say thank you very much for the Reader's Digest version, I really need the whole story, let's start all over again. And have them start writing all over again. What else is missing from our story? Yeah. They're not scared. They were under stress driving to the bank and making the deposit, but they're under stress because they're stealing the deposit, not because why would they be stressed when they're going when they haven't been robbed yet? Can I do another one? This is a night watchman case. I work the 12 midnight to 8 a.m. shift at the warehouse. I'm the only guard on duty during the shift. I have a on duty, bless you. I have on duty blocked because that's going to mean something later on in the statement. I like to arrive at work a few minutes early, usually 10 to 15 minutes. This gives me time to talk to the guard I relieve. That's extraneous information, but it's trying to convince us what a good employee they are. On the night of the break-in, I have break-in blocked out because as we get into the statement, you'll see that nothing is broke. They're referring to this as a break-in, but everything's unlocked. I arrived at 12, or 11.50, Don Smith, the 4P to 12 guard, and I had a conversation. And then a whole bunch of extraneous information about the conversation. The reason Don Smith is underlined is that is another thing we do is when somebody else is referenced in the statement, we underline it, and we would write that name or that person in the left margin. So then when we're done with the statement, we have a subsequent interview list now in the left margin because they've been referred to in the statement, they should be able to add some details that maybe we didn't get, so now we have some more people to interview. Now he was talking to Don, but Dan left at 11.55. <laughs> so what happened to Don? Since he knows, I like to start my rounds exactly at midnight, once again trying to convince us what a good employee they are. I began to suspect something was wrong about 3 a.m. Began is an editing word. Around 3 a.m. I noticed the back gate was unlocked. Well, he's been on duty since midnight and he's just now getting to the back gate at 3 a.m. A few minutes later, I was convinced something was wrong when I found the payroll office door unlocked and the safe open. I recalled reading a story last year about money being taken from another warehouse. The guy who took that money wasn't caught. <laughs> Would that guy be you? <laughs> My first reaction was to call the boss. Then what was your second, third, and fourth reaction because it took you an hour to do that? The boss was instructed us to call him any time in emergency. That's extraneous. He was pretty upset when I woke him up at 4 a.m., but you found it at 3, but you called him at 4. <clears throat> at no time did I see any strangers in the warehouse that night. That goes back to I'm the only one on duty. I did not see any strangers. So was it he and Don and Dan and whoever else worked there <laughs> carried the joint off because he knew who was there. They weren't strangers. And he was the only one on duty. And is the boss and my boss the same boss, or are we talking about different bosses? And I suggested we put another guard on, because if I got company, I'm less likely to steal. But I'm not going to guarantee it. It might help. And that's basically what happened. So once again, thanks for the Reader's Digest version. Let's start all over again with the whole story. So those are some samples of some cases that we've worked. Now let's 
parlay this into the news. Sir. No, his timeline does not make any sense whatsoever. Right, right. And no, his timeline did not make any sense whatsoever. So there's several questions we've been asking about a security, you know, one of those clock things that they got to punch a clock whenever they hit a key point in the building or whatever it is. So let's talk about some stuff that's been in the news. I just never liked my trachea. <laughs> he said this before he officially announced he was transitioning, which I got a problem with that word that my wife and I were talking about yesterday. There is no trans nothing. Either you're either this or you're either that. Amen. There is no transition nothing. But before Bruce thought he was transitioning, he just Never liked the trachea. So in that statement, the just doesn't make any sense. Is it just, that's all you don't like? Then how come you went on down that road? <laughs> Bill Cosby. Now I was real mad when I did this case because I grew up on Bill Cosby. And, whoops. I know people are tired of me not saying anything, but a guy doesn't have to answer innuendos. Is that an answer to the question? Did you do it? Let me say this, I only expect the black media to uphold the standards of excellence in journalism. And when you do that, then you have to go in with a neutral mind. Did he answer the question? No. Neither one of those are a denial of what he was accused of. He talked around it instead of addressing it. I did not do that. Done. Edward Snowden. They're, they ask him, did you run off to China to you know, were you a China spy, Chinese spy, and you ran off to China, and this was his answer. This is a predictable smear that I anticipated before going public as the U.S. media has a knee-jerk red China reaction to anything involving Hillary Clinton or PRC, I'm drawing a blank, and is intended to distract from the issue of the U.S. government's conduct. Ask yourself, if I were a Chinese spy, wouldn't I have flown directly to Beijing and be living in a palace, petting a phoenix? Once again, not an answer. Are you a Chinese spy? Jerry Sandusky. Anybody remember the Jerry Sandusky case? Which college was that? Penn State. Penn State. Jerry Sandusky is the, I think he was the athletic director of Penn State, was convicted for molesting little boys. This is his statement at the trial. They can make me out to be a monster, they can treat me as a monster, but they can't take away my heart. In my heart, I know I did not do these alleged and disgusting acts. Our heart doesn't do any thinking, does it? So what he's really saying is in my mind. He's referring to it as his heart, but what he's saying is in my mind, I didn't do this, because to him, doing these things were not disgusting, horrible acts. So that's how it made sense to him. Cam Newton, football fans. I don't remember the exact details. This has been a few years ago. They were set to win the football game. Cam Newton fumbled. Uh, New England, I think is who they're playing. New England recovered. And so they did not win the game. At the end of the game, Cam Newton says, I want to apologize to my teammates and to the fans that were watching out there. Is that an apology? What's wrong with it? That's an apology. 
all the rest of that is not an apology. I want to. I'm not going to. But I want to. If he really wanted to, I'd read like that. This is a call that came in to the Coast Guard off of the New England coast a few years ago that they ended up deeming to be a hoax. The radio call went, we have three deceased, nine injured. We have an explosion on board. That's why we're taking on water. I'm in about three and a half feet of water on the bridge right now. I'm going to stay on as long as I can before I have to bail. When people are deceptive, they have an innate need to tell you why something happened versus what. He's telling us why. We've had an explosion. Put yourself in his place. You're on a boat. You've had an explosion. People are hurt. Some are dead. Help! That's the call, right? Not, well, this happened and this happened this happened. So if you could. Another part of this is the number three. If you study deception and criminality, three is called the liar's number. Liars like to use things in, in reference to three. Three deceased, nine injured, that's a part of three. Had an explosion, three and a half foot of water. Three is a repeating number, repeating number in our claim here. Plus the incessant need to have to explain the why. So after a lot of Coast Guard resources were spent out there to look for anything and everything, they came up with nothing and finally figured out it was a hoax. So now let's do politics. Primarily social and about our travels. It primarily means there's a whole lot more you got to say. Because your primary, you just qualified your statement with, that's not all, by using the word primarily. If it was about social and travel, he said it was about social stuff in our travels. But when he threw in the word primarily, there's a flag. Scott Pelley, interview with Hillary Clinton. Scott Pelley, I think, was a CBS reporter, and I would be shocked to this day if he's still a CBS reporter because he cuts her no slack in this interview. And they probably, I'm surprised they let him finish the interview, but they probably showed him the door right after. So Pelley says, you know, in 76, Jimmy, Car Jimmy Carter famously said, I will not lie to you. Well, I have to tell you, I've tried in every way I know, literally from the years of my young lawyer, all the way through my time as a Secretary of State to level with the American people. Well, I gotta tell you, I've tried. <laughs> the interview goes on. Pelly says, you talk about leveling with the American people, have you always told the truth? I've always tried to. <laughs> always, always. It continues. Some people are gonna call that wiggle room you just gave yourself. <laughs> well, no, I've always tried. I mean, Jimmy Carter said, I will never lie to you. Well, but you know, you're asking me to say, have I ever? I don't believe I ever have. I don't believe I ever have. I don't believe I ever will. I'm gonna just do the best I can to level with the American people. <laughs> well. You'll never watch TV interviews the same way again. <laughs> it 
if I fumbled the ball, I'm going to wait until I get the next play and I'm going to try and run as hard as I can and do right by my team. So ultimately, I'm the head of this team. We did fumble the ball on it. If, there's your qualifier right off the get go. If I fumbled the ball, I'm going to wait until the next play, until I get the next play, and I'm going to try the best I can to run as hard. I, I, I is personal responsibility. I did this, I did this, I did this. I'm taking personal responsibility. If I said we went there, we did this, we did that, I'm dispersing the responsibility. He qualified it with if I fumbled, I, 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 I. We did fumble the ball. So we took that personal responsibility all the way through until the end and then it we, he, he could not hang on to the taking responsibility, he had to disperse it. I didn't do it, we did it. Talks on replacing and repealing Obamacare are and have been, on, have been going on and will continue until a, a time as a deal is hopefully struck. Now I'm on Twitter and I'm reading Twitter and I'm thinking, Yes, until I got to hopefully. Oh, because the hopefully just took away all the, we're going to do it, we're going to make it happen, hopefully. The qualifying word demeaned the whole tweet. James Comey. Now, I've been talking about deception and I've been talking about statements and in the news and politics. So I'm going to do something I don't often do in my classes, which is to play a little politics. But I hope the next time I put this picture in a slide, it's got bars in front of it. <laughs> and an orange jumpsuit. All right, so now I'm ready to wind down and ask questions. The, the business application of this, I've talked a lot about the law enforcement side, but the business application is if you're an HR director or something else, you can do it in interviewing skills. And to just touch on that for a little minute, I think I got enough time. How many of you interview people? As I said earlier, when we're deceptive, that causes stress. So when you're interviewing somebody and you put them under stress, they have to just, their body has to dispel that. When we interview people, we put them in a swivel chair. So when they start getting stressed, <laughs> that, start, that chair starts moving. Or they'll move what's called their anchor point. They'll readjust themselves in the chair. If you get them under enough stress, like there's the back door, and I'm sitting here talking to whoever's interviewing me and they make they get me under stress. I may be still be looking at them, but my feet are pointed toward that door and they're in a runner stance because that's where my body says I want to go. If you want to have fun with somebody, when you're having a conversation with them, start rubbing your chin. And if they're comfortable with you, before long, they're going to be rubbing their chin. And I dare you not to laugh. You can lean up against a wall, you can do, if somebody's comfortable with you and you're, we want to mirror who we're comfortable with. So you can do those, those things. If you're uncomfortable in an interview, people will do this, they'll start rubbing themselves. One of the, my associates that works with me said he interviewed a lady once and she took off her shoes and started massaging her feet. <laughs> That's how she was dispersing her stress. Any questions? Not, not obviously, because everybody still has a norm. Now, if, if you come in and you have a tick, you know, some people have this. That's, that's their norm. So we would overlook that. But if they come in and they started like this, and then a few questions in, 
that starts up. Now we got their stress being dispersed. A long time ago, they used to say if they looked down, it was this. If they looked here, it was that. People have their norms on that, too. And you have to establish their norm as to, and interviews will do that. They'll ask a question that, you know, who is your favorite teacher in grade school? Or whatever their norm is. And then later on, when they ask them a question, they'll see if they repeat that or if they break it. But interviews will ask questions to set that baseline, and then they'll look for you to break the baseline. That's another indicator is that they'll, no, I didn't do that. Sure. You can. Kids learn very young to lie. They will test you. I'm, how many moms do I have in here? The babies will start crying because they know they're either going to get picked up or a bottle. And if you don't come right away, then they'll stop. Like, oh, well, that didn't work. <laughs> and depending on how fast you are to that response, it's, you know, we are, you know, since the fall, we are inherently wicked. So we have those things that are going to, you know, we're deceptive, you know, almost from the womb on those things. Cry because I won't picked up and if nobody picks me up or, you know, kind of like, at home now, we have a long hair minister, Dachshund, and he has us trained well. <laughs> Just like your, train, your kids will train you well, and that's what they're doing when they're little. Okay, I'm going to cry. How long is it going to take for them to get here? Or, you know, then they may not always want to bottle, but they want picked up, or whatever it is. They start doing those things, and they establish those behaviors as they're growing up to see what's going to work for them and what's not going to work for them. And, you know, as a baby, they don't consciously know they're doing that, but they are. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, yes. And that's why when I collect statements in a case I'm working on, I'll ask them, like I ask you, what happened from the time you got up until the police came? or what time you got up until the fire truck came. Because say the event happened over the lunch hour, but I'm having you right from the time you got up through the lunch hour. So there's no reason for you to lie for, to me before the lunch hour. So that makes it easier for me because I'm a KISS principal guy. I want to make it as easy as I can. So I can establish your norm on how you're going to communicate with me before lunch. So then once we get into lunch, it makes it easier. Now I can still do it if I just ask you about lunch. It just slows me down. Anybody else? You sure can. <laughs> that is a very good question. That is a very good question. Actually, as my wife puts it, you know, the, the Lord made the first man called Adam. Adam. <laughs> so I really, unless I'm paying attention, I, you know, I'm not paying attention all the time. And my wife would tell you, I really pay attention. So no, I have to, I have to focus or, or pay attention to it. I'm not always on the, you know, people say, I'm not going to talk to you because, you know, you'll tell where I, I, I got to be paying attention. And most of the time I'm not. Anybody else? I have some cards up here on the front that are semi-related to this. I kind of teased on it earlier, but I've, this is not about politics. It's about deception detection. But if you come get one of my cards, then you'll understand why I said that. And then we can talk on the side, if you like. Or you can go to my website, which is rickwhitehead.com. And the gold one's the clue on the other part. 
So it's, while what I talked about is mostly about the police world, this is applicable to HR directors and in all aspects of our lives. If you do it enough, you'll never watch TV the same. You'll never watch any interviews on TV the same. When I watch movies, my wife will say, stop it! <laughs> because, you know, one of the, and this isn't related to deception, but when, you know, how many of you watch a cop movie? Shut up and watch the TV. Eat your popcorn. I feel like I gotta tell myself a little bit. I mean, you were like showing some of the slides and stuff. That doesn't really seem like the language is, you know, somebody that's uh, not educated might write that stuff. They very well. I know I, I read, a, I had a bit of a stenographer took a statement from me for a project I worked on. Right. And when I had to reread it to uh, make sure it was correct, what idiot said this? <laughs> My wife tells me that all the time. <laughs> I don't feel like I communicate that way, but when I read it, it's not very legible. But in, in reviewing that, you would have had a norm that we would have looked for that you wouldn't have broke. If you were being honest, you wouldn't have broke your norm. When you break your norm, it's a subconscious act that doesn't happen. Like, well, we kind of talked about it with the arson of, we have attachments to things we care about. So I left my house to go to breakfast. I came back to my house, did some chores. I left my house to go meet some friends for lunch. I came back to my house washed the truck, I left the house to go out to dinner. The last time I mentioned the house, it was the house instead of my house. If the house burns down while I'm gone, why did I break that connection with my house? Subtle little things like that, like the we instead of he or, or they. Those little subtle things, is, and we just look for them to stack up. I've had cases that's as easy as, I had a lady that said she was kidnapped and forced to do drugs and raped, and she came in and gave the detective a statement. And I worked the statement, and when he called her back in, I went in the office and you know, explained to her I was the captain and the FBI trained and yada, yada, yada. And then I held her statement out in front of her that I had analyzed, and it was almost wadded up because there was so much ink from the highlighters on it that had, you know, like I'd poured coffee on it. It was, so I said, is this a statement you wrote the detective? That it, you know, it's got highlighters and marks on it, but is that what you wrote? Yes. I said, all those colors and that marking means you're lying. Okay. <laughs> They're not all that easy, but they can be that easy. <laughs> but if something happened to you that was traumatic, that time would be locked in your brain. Yes. Yep. Uh, Mrs. Ford was correct. It was so traumatic it would be seared in your brain. That part is right. If it is traumatic, it is seared in your brain. But it just wasn't hers because it didn't happen. No, I've had lots of, I've had, not lots, I've had cases where all the indicators there and here's the problem and they just won't come off of their story. And it, an example of that is I worked an officer involved shooting where an officer with an agency off duty saw the law security people from a big box store chasing somebody. He was off duty, felt obliged to help, chased suspect into the woods, the loss prevention guys got lost or whatever, it was only him and the suspect in the woods, they were fighting he was in Texas, so he had on shorts and a t-shirt. He had his pistol in his pants, but he didn't have a holster. During the fight, the pistol came out, and in that struggle, the suspect got shot. It was an accidental death, because it was, when he picked up the 
pistol because it was on the ground. He's trying to get the guy's hands behind his back and get him handcuffed, and the pistol goes off and shoots the guy in the back of the head. It was an accidental discharge, and explainable, but that guy's what's going say, what gets us in more trouble than anything? Ego, right? That officer could not admit he made a mistake by not having his weapon holstered and then struggling with it in his hand and an accidental discharge. Now we have somebody that's dead, wrongfully. Instead, they made up a story about how the person got behind him was choking him out and he did this to shoot him. But the evidence did not line up with the story besides a lot of the other indicators we talked about tonight. You know, when he's talking about wrestling with the suspect and getting the suspect, you know, under control, the point of the story where the suspect is dead, instead of referring to him as the actor or the suspect, he referred to him as the body. It's only a body once you're dead. Before then, it's a person or a suspect. So that was the clue of where in, the, where in his story it went awry and had the accidental discharge, then then he made up the rest of it to cover that. But the evidence didn't, the evidence didn't jive. And no matter how much we tried to get him to admit you made a mistake, he wouldn't do it. He lost his career, got criminally filed on for, uh, uh, it wasn't homicide, but it was uh, manslaughter. Thank you. He lost his job, got filed on for manslaughter because he couldn't admit he made a mistake. It, the cleaner the statement, the more in their words. That statement I just referred to with the officer involved shooting, his statement that he produced was with the assistance of a lawyer. And even with the assistance of a lawyer, there was tons of, tons of color and problems with his statement, even with the lawyer helping him. Because the lawyer doesn't realize the changes, those psyche changes that indicate deception, the lawyer's just helping him write the statement. <laughs> my wife didn't come tonight. That'd be the person to ask that question. <laughs> she says my nose flares when I lie, so. Yes, sir. You said it was the easiest technique, or is that the one that you use the most to find out the most? To me, it's the easiest technique to find the deviations. If the pronouns are good, then I'll start over and I'll do the lack of conviction, the extraneous, and all the other stuff, the editing. I'll work it step by step through that. But to me, I shortcut to the pronouns because if the relationships aren't right, then. That's recording or written. Right. Yep. And the, the, key on, the key on recording is whoever does that typing has to do it exactly in their words. Whoever the, whoever the stenographer is has to know it has to be exactly in their words. Don't, don't assume they said something. Don't think they said something. If you don't know, put a few dots there and keep on typing, but it has to be in their words. You had a question, sir? Have you analyzed Jesse I've not. I've not. I still travel 20 to 25 weeks a year. So if, when you see me in church, I'm usually in the back row there in front of the sound booth, but it's very sporadic because in my consulting and training business, I travel extensively. So it's, it's finding the time to do that. The Ford Kavanaugh stuff, I did listening to the radio. I was, had been in South Idaho doing a class and was driving home, which is an eight hour drive. So on Sirius XM, I just listened to the testimony as it was going on. So as I'm driving, I'm talking to myself on the radio like, what? No. <laughs> and and her, her emotion was contrived. She would cry and then she would forget she was crying and she'd be laughing and then like, oh, I gotta be crying. And then she'd go back to crying. So you could, there was a lot of indicators in watching her and listening to her that didn't add up. You know, I didn't have to, I ended up pulling down their opening statements to do them, but I listened to the testimony on the road. Can I just ask you what I do in this church? I'm sorry? Can I ask what I do to this church? Pastor Tim led me to this church uh, because of the, well, yeah. But what, what the, the first time I attended this church and went home, and my wife did not attend with me, 
I went home and on the edge of tears told her that there's love in that church. I said, it doesn't make any difference who they are, what level of society they're at, what they've done, what they've cleaned up. Everybody in that church is loving on each other. That's how a church ought to work. Amen. Anybody else? Back in the back. <laughs> Empathy will get you a long ways. Now, and some investigators, a lot of line officers do not understand that. And I've seen line officers get really mad at detectives who have just interviewed a child molester and got the confession, but when they interviewed the child molester, they were their best friend. Look, I understand that. I, you know, I, you know, yeah, she batted her eyes, you know, I get it. When they empathize and they feel they have somebody in their corner, they're more apt to talk. So good investigators learn how to put their personal feelings aside and do that to get to the, the, the end. But a lot of people in our profession still don't understand that and they'll get mad by, how dare you, you know, be nice to him. Tough. Yes, can be, can be. I think one of the hardest nights I ever had from work was a guy had killed his wife in front of his kids. And I've been very good at my 40-year career of not letting stuff bother me. But when I got on that night, that bothered me a lot. And evidently still does. <laughs> Anybody else? Satan's can be that little voice in your head saying to do something and opposite of that other voice saying you know better. Amen. And I've been victim of following the wrong voice in my life. And only by the grace of God did it not end me up in jail or out of my career. But I've had personal struggles in my, you know, being a cop 40 years hasn't made me immune. A waste of time. It'd be a waste of time. Other than if I'm trying to figure out if they're drunk or not. <laughs> right. If there's any doubt, then we'd redo the statement. If, if I was interviewing somebody in jail, I would wait after they'd been there several days to make sure that's out of their system. If they're not in jail and I suspect something, then I would repeat the interview again and, or the statement again and see how they played out together. They would, I haven't had a lot of experience in that because mine's always in the investigation after the fact, but even in their high state, they're gonna have a norm. So an officer interviewing them on the street in reference to a crime might be able to pick up some, some things. And I trained a lot of street officers. I've trained a lot of line officers. I've trained Texas Rangers. I've trained investigators of all types. Um, and just for the mystique of things, Texas Rangers are no more than a detective for the Texas Highway Patrol. It's not, a, I mean, it's, they got a TV show, but there's a, Texas, Texas Rangers is a detective for the Highway Patrol. Um, lawyers, investigators, uh, uh, IRS investigators, that probably made me the most nervous. Since I was wondering, all this information you went over, is it is it a available any place? There are several different books out there 
that you could buy and people will talk about it. And the main, probably the main point of it is, is I, I refer to it as indicators of deception. Probably the truer analysis is they're under stress and they threw a cue because they're under stress. And then through my interview, it's to figure out whether, why they were under stress and whether it was deceptive or not. The same thing with, you know, if I'm interviewing somebody and they're, you know, they start doing this or they, you know, they might be uncomfortable, but it's not, it's not because they're being deceptive. It's just whatever we're talking about, they don't like. And I'll give you an example. I have a, a colleague that was interviewing a lady for a job and she failed the polygraph and he brought her back in and she thought she was a great candidate. And she failed the polygraph and brought her back in and what are you not telling us? And she's like, I'm not. So after a couple of interviews, what he finally got out of her was, in her early years, she had had an abortion. And while that was not illegal, whenever they asked the question, have you ever done anything illegal, it tripped the polygraph because in her mind, it was. So it was, even though she wasn't being deceptive, in her mind, she had broke the law, even though she hadn't. It was a conscious, it was a, you know, a moral thing for her that, but it through, was through the, the guy being a good investigator that was able to uncover that she wasn't being deceptive, that it was a personal feeling that was causing the, so she ended up getting the job and agreed the job, but they had to get past that. That's why when they interview you is, you know, tell us the truth because we'll get through, you know, Whatever it is, tell us the truth so we can get to the end of it. I had a guy who worked in California. Tried to get a job in California, having a troll. The guy denied because he said he never took drugs. He never had. He produced everything he has. It's a small thing. And that's just a bad investigator. Yeah, that's the same. Right. Yeah. Right. We're, we're human and we're only as good as what we can do. No, it's not that high. And science, I didn't run the video. I have a one minute kind of commercial that I do for my online class, because this class is available online if you get on my website. It's an eight hour class. Science says that statement analysis is more accurate than the polygraph. Now I have some associates that are polygraphers and will argue that point because that's their livelihood, but the scientists say that statement analysis is better, but nothing's 100%. I don't know. I know I gave it to Pastor Tim, and do you have that handy? No. no. I'm on my laptop up here, which is not connected to this, which was, this was my cue card while that was going, which was the confusion while we were doing the deal. Any other questions, sir? No, no, no. Uh, you're talking about the baby Dior? Yeah. Kavanaugh was the Supreme Court justice oh, oh. deal that they gave him. Baby Dior is in South Idaho where daddy came home from work. Mama says, we're going camping. And he's like, okay. But they're not married, but it's their baby. They go by and pick up grandpa. Grandpa has a buddy with him. They go into the mountains. Mama and daddy walk out of camp. Baby Dior starts to follow him. Daddy says, go back to Grandpa. They turn and walk away. And that's the last time anybody, they say, saw Baby Dior. They think, they tried to write it off as a cougar, a bear, or something, you know. But in, in analyzing their statements, well, also part of the evidence was searching cell phones and things like that. And her cell phone showed that she was looking to, you know, how do you break up with somebody? She had had previous children with another man, and that man had custody of the kids. So she's, the only tie between her and him now is Baby Dior. Baby Dior goes missing camp and there's no more ties and they're not together anymore. So her and Grandpa, and whoever Grandpa's buddy was, know what happened to Baby Dior, but they're not talking. The family hired a private investigator out of Texas, and then after the private investigator did all their work, said, you're lying, and then they fired him. 
So, the, but the sheriff's office still hasn't solved it. They got a good. They they know who it is. They just can't prove who it is. Anybody else? I did not work that case. It was one given to me as an example. But if I would have worked it, when I got to that first we, and, I, and let me set it up better. When I get a statement, I would give you a legal pad, have you write it down, and then I would say, you know, can you come back next Tuesday, 10 o'clock? And I would give myself a week to do the analysis and get my interview questions ready. Because as I'm doing the analysis and that highlighting and all those marking, I have a separate legal pad here where I'm right now in questions, where those blue boxes popped up and other things. As I'm doing the analysis, I want to know, okay, well, how come you said that? What happened here? I'm writing down questions. So then that next week when I bring you back, now I'm prepared with my questions as to where to drill in with that statement. And I would drill in on all those we's and the lack of emotion. It's not a fast process. In my class, I make them do 19 in one day just to learn the techniques and they go home brain dead. <laughs> but to do it case-wise, I spend three or four days working it. I'll get it, I'll sleep on it, I'll work it again, I'll walk around and let it cook and I'll work it again. And then as I'm doing it, I'm writing questions and it evolves over the three or four times I analyze it. Anybody else? Thank you very much. I got cards up here.